Hi, everyone. It's Raghu Marcus with Ramdas Here and Now, a new edition. And uh, before I get into this uh, great, actually, compilation of excerpts of talks that uh, Ramdas gave around conscious parenting. So for all of you guys out there that are parenting, and then for everyone that is going to be parenting, and then for those of us that have, have parents, which we all do, uh, there's some great insights. But before I get into that, so I'm just back from Maui and the winter retreat, our December retreat, Open Your Heart in Paradise, which was fantastic. It was the largest group we've ever had. So there was a lot of really great energy. And um, it was all around Love Everyone. And you've heard me talk about the book on previous podcasts by Parvati Marcus. And it's the story of our journey following Ram Dass back to India and meeting Neem Karoli Baba Maharaji. And some great, great stories. And it's all of us Westerners, so it's Im immensely relatable. And uh, people are really enjoying it uh, by the time uh, this podcast uh, is going to air here, just before Christmas, a week before. But maybe Amazon, you can get it shipped to your door or to your loved ones as a uh, Christmas present. Love everyone, so I had to say that. And the whole retreat was about love everyone. We had a whole bunch of people from who had been with us in India, Ram Das and Krishna Das and Ramesh Das and Mirabai Bush and myself and I could go on and on. There was really about 15 of us there, so it was quite a, a, re, a bit of a reunion. Wonderful time that we had. Um, and there was one great thing. Talk about podcasts. I know some of you know, or many of you know, that I do a podcast called Mind Rolling on the mindpodnetwork.com. little plug for the network. And uh, I did one thing that I... It was a live podcast at the retreat with Duncan Trussell and Sharon Salzberg, and a little guest star with Pete Holmes, a friend of Duncan's, also a comedian from Los Angeles who has a big podcast show. But uh, I, just all to say, uh, this will be up there probably at the turn of the year or the end of this year. Look for it because it's just fantastic how Sharon answers some of the questions these guys had and uh, about her personal practice. Uh, it, there was some stuff in there that was so enlightening for me. I just had to give everyone a tip to share that. So that'll be coming up soon. Check it out on MindPod Network. And uh, this is the end of the year. So it's the time when we've been doing fundraising for Love, Serve, Remember Foundation. So all those of you that uh, want to gift anything before the end of the year to get your donor letter. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, so you get a tax-deductible donation. Sounds like a Bob Dylan song. And uh, please, uh, can, we've gotten so much great support from everyone. Uh, I can only say thank you, really. The gratitude is huge, um, and, and we're really happy, everybody on the board and, and the foundation, and of course, Ram Dass. So, but uh, it is that time of year, and we course need the continuing support so that we can continue these programs that we've been putting out online courses and movies and we have a great movie coming out next year that you'll hear about uh in the uh, in january okay enough of that conscious parenting so this is great uh, he's uh, just a, a couple of quotes from here that really struck me and one of course the gita you know the gita says that the greatest birth is in a family of yogis Right? So those are people not caught so much in the illusion of separateness. So, uh, you know, small children, when they're in the presence of parents who are very spacious and aware, the child develops a somebodyness, but not at the level that it entraps them. Okay? So obviously there still is ego development, but if you're with parents... I don't know how many of us can say it. Ram Dass says in this thing, of course, that wasn't my parents. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't my parents. It was my parents way later in life after they met Maharaji, or at least uh, my whole family did. I think I've said this on previous podcasts. Mother met Sidima. But, uh, but it's possible. So at the level, but not at the level that it's so... 
When you're with spacious and conscious and aware parents, the child still develops an ego structure, but not at the level that it entraps them, that it, that it becomes a function. So you become a functional somebodyness, not an entrapping somebodyness. This is a huge thing when you really think about your life and how we are so identified with our uh, different roles and so on. And should we be a little bit, have been uh, with people who were free of their roles to some degree, uh, we would probably not have some of the same neurosis that we do now. Uh, And then further, so as you cultivate as as quickly as as you can with your children, this this is just tremendous advice, you cultivate that we're fellow travelers, right? That I'm in a role of caretaker, And you're in the role of child. And we recognize that. And slowly, we are going to emerge as two friends. And that, for me, that completely happened, especially with my, both my parents, but especially with my father, who spent a lot of time in India, or quite some time in India with Maharaji. So that's a whole other miracle story. And you be available for that role as soon as you can. Then you become a dharmic parent, a conscious parent. So that, that's... Uh, the other interesting thing, this uh, he did when he was a child psychologist, I guess, they did a thing around heredity and, and environment to see what effect it has on the development of an individual. And apparently it only counts for 25%. <laughs> Where the hell's the rest of it? Maybe past lives, right? They don't account for that in any child development test. I myself know that I have two sons. And... Uh, they grew up in a, shall we say, marijuana was a sacrament environment, a little bit of hippie thrown in. And one of them was like, okay, uh, his mother took him to India and he was like, okay, when, uh, and of course they were different spots where he noticed adults, sadhus, along with his mother and his mother's friends, joining in a little chillum smoking. And he was like, well, okay, when can I do that? And she said, well, you got to wait till you're 16. Other people would say 18, 20, but she said 16. So when he was 16, he knocked on my door that day. Uh, the other son has never, to this day, had a toke in his, in his life, nor a drink. So where did that come from? Heredity and environment? I don't think so. Uh, so interesting, interesting uh, point. So here we go. For all of you out there, as I said before, it applies to everybody. You don't have, a, have to have a child to get some uh, insight from Ramdas around this particular topic. Conscious parenting. Ramdas, here and now. In the relationship with a child, in the same way as the relationship with a partner, the job of the more conscious being is to remember that while this is a personality and a child and your child, behind it all, it is another soul. And the two of you have taken birth in order to live out this particular drama together as mother and child or father and child. And so if you remember that, then you see the drama that you're caught in as mother and child or as, or as parent and child. You see that drama from a perspective where you see it just as the work of life rather than as the place in which you're living. It's not the whole thing. It's something else. And because of the incredible attachment that is involved between a parent and a child, and because it is so... It's such a profound attachment, which partly is species survival, that you have to be that attached. So, it's, I mean, it's really deep in. Your survival, the survival of your child, reproduction, are heavy built in for the species to survive. If you didn't care, if you didn't eat, or if you let your children be eaten by wolves, uh, that would be the end of the species, you know. So you really have to have that tigress quality about you, that kind of attachment. And it's built into the system. Then the question is, where are you in relation to that system? 
And it is extremely hard, as like the, uh, you know the story of the monk whose child died, and uh, uh, somebody came up and they found him crying, and they said, why are you crying? You're a great master. You know it's all an illusion. He says, yes, but the death of a child is the greatest illusion. It's like, you know, I, I hadn't gone through that one yet, because that's, that's the one that got me, and uh, it's, it's a very heavy and deep one. So you're dealing with one of the most powerful forces of your incarnation, that kind of attachment. And the minute you are attached to how it comes out with your child, that they should turn out a certain way, or any of those things, you have immediately lost your ability to hear the truth of the situation. Because remember the Tao says, truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. The minute you want anything, you only see the outward container. The interesting thing parents find is that the minute they come up for air, especially with very young children, they look at the child and the child is right there because the child hasn't yet closed down fully. The child usually by five or six has closed down. They've gone into their somebodyness, maybe by two or three for most kids in that negative stage of no, where they're really pushing against and defining their, their territory and their somebodyness. But you see that in some conditions, like they say in the Gita, a fortunate birth is one where you're born to the family of yogis. Because these are people who, have, who are not caught in the illusion of their own separateness, so they don't reinforce your separateness. Now, some of the separateness that a child develops is functional and necessary for survival. You've got to become somebody to become nobody. Little children, sometimes when they're in the presence of parents who are very spacious in awareness, the child develops a somebodyness, but not at the level that it entraps them that hard. It becomes a functional somebodyness, not a, an entrapping somebodyness. And that's very interesting. Sometimes in teenagers, it seems like it gets lost because they're going through so much storm and drang in their change that they are so busy needing to be somebody. But when they have been around conscious parents in the early years, they get through it very quickly and they come through and they start to let go of it quickly afterwards. And it's quite beautiful because I watched many of the children of my friends who were relatively conscious people, relatively, I mean, not really conscious, but relatively. And I watched the kids be tyrants, I mean, ghastly, you know, like, really, you know, it would take a parent to love them. And, <laughs> and, um, and then I watched them turn out into these absolutely beautiful, compassionate, thoughtful, reflective, quite aware human beings. And I begin to see sort of the way in which this game is working much more clearly than I understood it before. Uh, you're bound to lose it into power struggles. And it is the conscious person who learns how to define limit without closing your heart. If you think not saying no is the sign of consciousness, you've got to realize that for a child, they need limits defined of their behavior. And they really, although they will rail against it, that's part of the way in which they have enough structure in order to build a, a, a self-concept and a functional way of being in the world. The question is how you say no. And this is such interesting work on all of us. Because when you say no to another person, two things happen. One is you identify with them. Like, can I have an ice cream cone? No. Wah! Okay. You are that child that didn't get the ice cream cone. So you're angry. The other thing is somebody you love is now angry at you. So you get a double whammy. And because it's so heavy at that moment, what you do is you pull your heart back to protect yourself. So you say no. Different than yes. Yes has a, like an embracing quality. No has a protective quality. And so when you start to examine that in yourself, you keep learning how to work. All of it is examination, just witnessing, noticing, noticing how many times you got lost into the power structure, and then you come up for air again. You keep coming up for air. And the work you do in yourself, the meditation, the practice, and the cultivating with your child as quickly as you can that we are fellow beings together, and I am in the role of your caretaker, and you are in the role of my biological child, and slowly we are going to emerge into two very deep friends. 
and cultivate that and be available for that role as early as you can, continuously if you can. And that forces you to examine your need to be a parent, your need for power, your need for control, your need to have somebody, you know, somebody totally dependent upon you. And when you have dealt with that stuff, then you're offering friendship to this fellow soul and you you become a dharmic parent, a dharmic parent, meaning somebody who's fulfilling the role because it's your dharma, because you are a parent. That's the appropriate thing to do. When a child incarnates into form, awareness is not differentiated yet, so there is no separate entity, there's no somebodyness, there's no conceptual model. So indeed, that being is much closer to this. However, they are also a kind of a DNA a disaster waiting to happen, I mean, so to speak, because there's a historical thing here that's, that's lurking in the child. And that has to do with its genetics, its environment, it's a whole set of conditions that determine the way it's going to unfold. The idea is the ego is an exquisite instrument. It's the central computer for living on this plane. It's a terrible master and a wonderful servant. And if you have parents who know that, they won't suck you in to your, to your ego like my parents did to me. And then I don't have to escape. And, but a child will still have to develop this, but they will be able to let it go much sooner. And there'll even be, there'll be times, at least before adolescence, when there's a, sometimes a pretty dark period because of the power of the forces down in here. But most of the time, you can, if you're clear enough, the child meets you back behind. I love sitting on an airplane where there's a baby in the row in front of me, and it looks over the seat, and it looks at you, and you just sit there, and the two of you just look at each other. It's so extraordinary where you meet. <laughs> Parents saying, don't bother the man. <laughs> Buddha, don't go away. I think that when you look at a child, for that child to survive on Earth, they have to take seriously that they're somebody. Nobody doesn't make it on Earth. Somebody makes it on Earth. Once you've made it and you've stabilized and you've got your ground, then you can start the exploration of nobody. To start the exploration of nobody before you've established your base camp in somebodyness is often a little bit disorienting, as you, we found out from many people along the way. I think the optimum thing is to become somebody in the presence of caretakers and socializers who realize they are nobody being somebody. All right? Let the child enter into somebodyness as much as they need to, but you're already always ready to meet them outside. There are two kinds of relationships that we enter into. I tended to call them given and acquired. A given relationship are your parents, or your children. You can't trade them in. They're given. Friends are acquired. You can drop them. Marriages are an ambiguous place. You can look at it either way. Historically, it was until death do us part, which meant that you took, you acquired a relationship that then became given karma. You couldn't walk away from. And in India, when the partner died, the, the, the man died, the wife threw herself on the funeral pile. Because they were together till death. We changed the marriage because of our personality orientation. We changed it from a given karmic situation into an acquired karmic situation where you can change it if it doesn't work well. Parent and child relationship, which is all given karma. You look at why you had your kid. I mean, what did I do? What did I do in a past life to have deserved this grace? <laughs> See? <laughs> your mind's your problem. I'm not buying it. <laughs> if you look at evolution of consciousness as something that happens in individuals, not in large numbers, but in individuals. So as you look out on the street, you're seeing a cross-section of evolution. You're seeing, I'm talking now from a reincarnational model, which for some of you I know is alien, but just humor me. Some of the people you're seeing are very old beings. That is, they're beings who have incarnated many, many times and for whom the veil is very thin. They really, they've 
gone into the movie so many times and into the drama so many times that although they're in it, they're just about seeing through it. It's pretty frayed. And they can sort of see through the cloth already. See, the extreme ends of the, re of the evolutionary continuum are somebody like a saint in India like Ramana Maharshi, a being who, who doesn't do any sadhana, no spiritual practices, nothing. And at 17 years old, He's lying in his uncle's study, and he suddenly feels he's going to die, and instead of fighting, he just opens to it, and he experiences the death of his body, and just goes on, and then the body doesn't physically die, but he dies out of it. And from then on, for the next 40 or 50 years, he's one of the great enlightened saints of India. And people who come to him get great peace and great wisdom and great understanding and great love. And he's what's called an old being. He was ripe. He didn't have to do anything then there are beings who we suspect came to earth fully conscious with the intent of doing things for other people, like a Christ. Then we have people like the Buddha who work and do sadhana during their lifetime, and they're old beings, but they still do something to get to the point where they finally get free, but they get free in this lifetime. Then there are other beings, like, for example, me, I think, who just works, realizes in this birth that there is an awakening possibility and starts the journey and continues the journey that I've been probably doing in the past many lifetimes and probably will be doing for many lifetimes yet to come. And I just do it and I'm stopped counting and I'm just doing it because what else is there to do than work to wake up and to be free? And I have no expectation that I'm about to get enlightened or I'll be enlightened this life or any of that stuff. It doesn't even matter to me anymore. Because I don't have any choice anyway. And then there are new beings who just recently came out of the Neanderthal stage. And they've just come to Earth, see? And they, they are just, I want this and gimme and rrrr and rrrr and rrrr and rrrr. And they have it from birth to death, and they're frightened of death, and they grab life, and they just want more. And God is a bunch of crap, or else it's some ritual that they do mechanically. There's no feeling. There's no sense of a higher, a sense of a, a, a way or a, a form of the universe. They don't have any sense of that. They don't have any connection to their intuitive sense. You know. Well, the funny thing is that you can have a family in which the whole range is within one family. In fact, you may have married one. I mean, you may have married for a peculiar reason, like passion, for example. And you end up with a post-Neanderthal married to an old Tibetan Lama. You know, I mean, it's... And they just happen to be together for some bizarre reason, you know, and... And they wake up one morning wondering, what the hell am I doing in this situation? They come rushing to me saying, I'm working on myself spiritually, and what am I going to do with this one? You see, and that's... Well, so it is with your kids. Your kids are unique entities that have come to Earth to do their unique work. And you may be surprised if you have two or three children why they are all so different. Because you did the same thing, and they grew up in the same... You know, I was a, psych, I was a child developmental psychologist, a research scientist in developmental psychology, trying to explain why children turn out the way they do in view of what parents do. And we did things with computers and experiments and double-blind and all kinds of good stuff. And the best we ever were able to do in the big issue of heredity and environment was if you put both heredity and environment together, you could probably account, you could get a correlation of what's called 0.5, which means you were accounting for 25% of the variability. 25% of the range of what happened to kids you could account for by everything that we could measure. 75% we called error. 
And I learned that I have been living for the past 20 years in error. I mean, it turns out that's where I live. It's error of reincarnation and all that kind of stuff. So that when I, I see families, I see a tremendous mixture. And the minute you get into the judging mode, you are in a tricky position. The minute you decide that older is better, like if you understand the whole sense of the circle of incarnation, being an older being isn't better, it's just different. Would you say that 20 years old is better than 10 years old? Just different. And you realize that each being has a unique route through with unique ways of getting caught and attached and awakening or not awakening, and you end up being an appreciator of individual differences rather than a judge about them. I said this before, and I've got to keep re-saying it because it's so easy to get sucked into that. I went to college. Why aren't you going to college? Because I'm dancing to a different drama. Don't give me that crap. Go to college. You'll be sorry later. I mean, we all know all the routines that, we're, that we've all grown up around in the culture of I know what's best for you because it was good for me. Because we have the kind of individual freedom that nobody in the world has ever had before. But that individual freedom we are finding out can be a path to incredible suffering. If we throw out the baby with the bath. And to invite, I mean, when the grandfather helped raise the grandson, and they went fishing together, and they talked, and the grandfather told stories to the kid all day, there was a whole cultural transmission that went on of the wisdom of what that man had learned that was passed on to the generation. It doesn't happen with Looney Tunes on Saturday morning in television. It just doesn't, it's not the same transmission. It's for a different motive, it's a different set of motives. So when you have relationships that are given karma, and you have people that are from all different levels of consciousness, and you've been thrown together with them, I can't understand why I've been thrown together with my older brother. His interests are not my interests. If I were choosing who I would hang out with, I wouldn't choose my older brother to hang out with, or either one of them, actually. But I have them, and there they are. And what happens is, I learn a lot about who I am not and who I am just through being around them. Although I wouldn't have chosen. And that's the interesting thing, that given karma overrides choice. The choices that personality makes. It's a chance to see the way in which you have catered to your personality and a, a chance to push against it a little bit. I'm playing with a, such a delicate and uncomfortable edge. The idea that fulfilling roles brings freedom, even though the, and the roles are not just responding to your personality desires and needs. Gandhi once said, civilization is the art of voluntary renunciation. It means you give up certain things in yourself in order to be able to play a part in a dance. Our relationships with each other can be vehicles for growth. They can be vehicles for our entrapment. Our relationships with one another can be vehicles for bringing us more into the universe, into the moment, into the flow of things. Or they can be vehicles for isolating us more into our separateness. In my relationship with you, who I think I am affects who I see you to be. I'm driving down the street. I'm in a rush to get to an appointment I'm a little late for. There's a car in front of me that is slowing down at a corner unnecessarily. I experience anger at the person that's driving. I swerve to go by the car with anger in my heart. And I look and I see that it is an older, confused man who is lost. 
and I feel guilt. My attachment to getting to my appointment made me see that person as an obstacle and get impatient. I go into the bank with a check to cash or a deposit to make. I walk up, wait in line, and get to the teller. Who do I see? I see the cashier of my check. I may go through a perfunctory smile. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you. Have a good day. Nothing happened. I stayed in my isolation. Teller in his or hers. Now I'm the bank teller. Person by person comes before me. Now a deposit, now a check cashing, now a certified check, now a, a money order. All day long, people giving me hello, smile, yes, nod. Here's your receipt, thank you, have a good day, yes. I feel lonely amidst a crowd of people. These are not uh, exceptional examples. They're examples that, that are common to most of our lives, much of the time, that in our efficiency to get on with life, we tend to see other people slightly as objects who are instrumental to our getting what we need. You can see the extreme case in an autistic child who wants something from the refrigerator and takes your hand to the refrigerator door. It just knows that hand opens that door. It doesn't even relate to you, just the hand opens the door. And often, parents with new children feel their egos very scrunched as the, as the baby only sees them as something to gratify the baby's needs. If I am hungry, if I'm very hungry, I can't help but look at you in terms of whether or not you are going to feed me. If I'm hungry enough, I'm going to look at you as to whether or not you have food, as the Donner Party did. If I have a strong need that I identify with, everybody around me is going to be seen in relationship to whether or not that need is going to be satisfied by that person. And if not, they are of no concern to me. In the world of lust, you can watch people relate to each other through lust. And you can see that as they walk down the street with lust, with sexual desire, sexual arousal, they look at other people and they see them either as a potential, a competitor, or irrelevant. And if you walk down one of those streets, you will experience yourself as being seen as one of those three categories. We each have these structures in our minds, these models, of who we are, what we need, where we're going, what we think it's all about. And these models define what we see out in the world. Not only that, but they are what another person receives from us. One person is busy planning a career. One person is busy dealing with separation. One person is busy with grief over loss. One person is busy with sexual identity problems. One person is, per is busy with a potentially terminal illness. One person is, is busy struggling for independence, and on and on. Each of us in this room has a personal drama. We have a curriculum that we're going through, as Emmanuel would say. You and I are not our curriculums. We reduce ourselves to less than we are if we define ourselves only as our curriculum. How do you do? Who are you? I'm retired. Fine. I'm a lawyer. I'm a mother. I am. Is there a difference? I am. I'm also those things, but I am. See, the minute you say, like, take a mother, I am a mother, what happens when there's nobody around for you to mother anymore? Do you exist? You desperately look around. I better get a dog or a cat or find others who need me to mother because I got a mother because that's who I am. I don't exist other than I'm a mother. And if you don't think that that is a major problem in this culture, you're mistaken because a lot of the root of alcoholism in women in their 50s and thereabouts is because their function with which they identified is no longer in demand. It's like having 
the biggest supply of Nixon buttons right after Watergate. I mean, you know, it's like nobody wants them. What are you going to do with them, you know? That's a crude analogy, pardon me. I, I don't know where this stuff comes from even. I, I... Uh, the question is, what do you do to help a child keep space and not get caught in the story? And the answer is, you work on yourself to be a spacious, resonant environment that is around the child so that if the child chooses to come out and play, there's nothing in you that's going to keep them stuck in being who they thought they were. If they're the thimble or the iron, you don't say you shouldn't be the thimble or iron because they can't. The only thimbles hear that and only irons hear that. What you are is a space that says this is a fellow soul who happens to be my child at the moment and we're playing Monopoly together and this child is really caught in this game, but that's the way this child is. See, parents get into the thing, I'm supposed to do something to the child. And my feeling is that the optimum parent is somebody who keeps a spacious environment that allows the child's karma to do what it does, but doesn't feed the karma, doesn't feed the identity of the child as being a top hat or an iron. By reacting, by saying you shouldn't be, See, that's a reaction that reinforces the reality of it. Work on yourself to become empty and spacious and present. You protect the child from biological harm, and you all open the environment as much as possible to all the different planes, to information, but also to vertical, to spirituality, to wisdom, to emptiness. And that has to do with the, the nature of your own consciousness. You work on yourself as a gift to your children, and the child will or won't respond. See, you can't do it that way, because you don't know what the karma of that child is. But you can't say, well, Sam did it, so you should do it, because there is a two entirely different beings. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening, and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.